specifically within the mobility side, you don't have to stop necessarily what you're doing. It's only just feeding into what you want to do, right? It's just feeding into and improving, hopefully, the experience of the activities and lifestyle that you want to live. Maybe adding in this five-minute mobility warm-up or this five-minute morning routine, like small practices, small habits that eventually will add up. The goal of the Best You Podcast is to allow you to feel confident about what you need to do, why you need to do it, and how to do it in order to get closer and closer to your best you. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I am really excited to be joined by the one and only Christian Placencia. Christian, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today, man. Of course. Thank you very much for having me, Nick. Really appreciate it. Yeah, dude. Well, I'm, I'm glad we were finally able to make it work. We got introduced through uh, Alan Stein a a few months ago now, and I know you're super busy training so many people, so I appreciate you taking the time in between sessions to join me today, and I can pick your brain about a few things, but the way I kind of want to start is just really quick introducing you to kind of everybody. So you've had this passion for basketball for a long time, ever since maybe about 10 years old, and then at 12 years old, you had an injury, and you spent a lot of time in the physical therapist, and you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. Like, people helping other people get better. And you had, you continue to have kind of a passion for that, but a passion for basketball. And then you kind of realize, okay, this basketball thing is probably only going to go so far. And I don't really want to play at the professional level, but maybe there's this other avenue where I can stay in the game and be maybe a physical therapist or maybe a sports performance coach. And so you had an internship uh, at the physical therapist clinic for a while. And then you went to school and you started to study it. And then you went to grad school for exercise physiology, which kind of brought you where you are today at University of Texas in Austin. And, you know, the your website is called Dur- uh, Durable Athlete, right? Yeah, durableathlete.com. Wanted to make sure I had that right. Durable Athlete. And so your big thing is kind of mobility and durability to help maximize somebody's potential from a performance standpoint, but also maximize the longevity of both the everyday person and maximize the longevity of a career and prevent injury and stuff like that. So for people out there who listen to this show, who are, who do get after it in the gym and get after it working out, which is, you know, most people who listen to this show, uh, cause I'm a fitness trainer and it's called the best you podcast. You don't listen to the best you podcast. If you, uh, aren't about getting better, especially when it comes to your health, um, for those people who get after it at the gym, but maybe they don't spend a whole lot of time focusing a lot of the things that you do when it comes to mobility and durability, what's your message to them that kind of beats it into their brain why it's so important to spend time with mobility and durability exercises? Yeah, no, that's a great question. First off, thanks for the for the introduction. That was great. You, you hit it on the mark right there. That usually takes <laughs> about 15 or 20 minutes because I can go down some rabbit holes, but that was that was perfect. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, so that's a great question. I think to be honest, in my opinion, and this is, I guess, maybe a little pull from like, you know, uh, the business side and the marketing side is like, you have to make it tangible, right? Like it has to be tangible for the individual. I can talk about all of the benefits from a science perspective, maybe somebody who maybe has an analytical and a science background, they might resonate with that and be like, you know what? Yeah. All the blood flow and all the stuff that you're talking about and the joint hygiene, like that just got it. It just clicked for me. Most people are not wired that in that way. Um, so for me personally, it's just trying to figure out like, okay, well, who is the individual that is in front of me? What do they prioritize? What is important to them? What are the daily activities? Um, you know, physical, mental, you know, emotional, all the deals. Like what, what are the things that they're involved in and invested in on a daily basis? And how can I get them to understand that this idea of mobility and training for durability is further than just a one hour in the weight room, right? It is all about, you know, trying to optimize your entire life inside the gym and outside the gym. So I would say, you know, it's, it's never really like a gold standard answer, but I think the principle of it really just comes down to like, okay, what do they prioritize? Like, what do they really care about in life? If it's a, a dad or a mom of, you know, two to four kids and they live for their kids and their entire life is about making sure that they have the best life possible, then, you know, maybe some of it is around like, hey, like if you want to continue to play with your kids, you know, you want to continue to take your kids on trips, you want to, you know, do the 16 hour car drives, you want to play soccer with them at the field, like there's going to reach a point where like you're going to need to take care of your body 
slightly differently than just, you know, going for a 60 minute, you know, high intensity workout, which again is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's it's healthy. That's a good thing. But if you're always relying on that as the main crutch for your physical practices, then at some point you could expect everybody, even including myself can expect some type of breakdown to occur. Um, so I think it's just finding out what's, what's tangible for them. And then honestly, sometimes the best teacher, unfortunately is injury, right? Like a lot of people are just like, it's the last resort. I got to do this now. Yeah. And that's actually funny. They said that because that's what I was getting ready to say. I've really only started to prioritize the, the mobility and kind of durability stuff over the last couple of years, really more over the last year, more than anything. And kind of it was, it was for me kind of ankle an ankle injury that when I was like pursuing a running goal that really had me prioritize it. So I think that is one thing for sure. If you have the setback, hopefully that can be motivation enough to get back from the setback and and prevent future setbacks. And the other thing for me personally is seeing improved mobility having done it and also and also just seeing improved performance and feeling better having done it. And so I think, you know, that's not necessarily super tangible, but if you can see kind of measurable progress with your own mobility, I think that's really a huge way for people too. 100%. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, a big piece of it really specifically within the mobility side is just trying to get to people to understand that you don't have to stop necessarily what you're doing. It's only just like feeding into what you want to do, right? It's just feeding into and improving hopefully the experience of the activities and lifestyle that you want to live. Um, right. that's, that's kind of, yeah, I think you've hit it on the head with that. Like you don't have to stop doing everything that you're doing, just maybe adding in this five minute mobility warm up or this five minute morning routine, or, you know, this five minute meditation practice before you go to bed, like small practices, small habits that eventually will add up. Yeah. So I think for people listening, and I think that's relatively intuitive for people to know, but one of the things, the different things that you talk about mobility on a very regular basis is hips you know, knees, ankles, uh, shoulders, are those kind of maybe the four biggest things that people should be training mobility and durability wise and, and sh- kind of in strengthening wise on a regular basis? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I guess if we had to try to simplify, yeah, I would, I would guess, I'm not guess, but I guess I would say that the spine, the shoulder, the hip is probably like the big three, like you could maybe get away with it from there, from that standpoint. Um, I'm a real big fan of just always taking care of like the foundation. Like, so the feet and the ankles being like very important. Um, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything else isn't as important, I guess. Right. But, but yeah, if you had to kind of give like a big three, I think the spine hips and shoulder is a great place to start. Cause you will get some type of benefit through like the adjacent tissue. So like, you know, your, uh, your elbow joint or your wrist joint from doing stuff like your shoulder. And same thing with like the knee and the ankle, like you'll get some type of benefit if you're focusing on the hip. Um, and so, yeah, that, if, if I had to give a big one, I would say yes to that. Yeah. So I think it's just super important to, for people to realize one of the things that I talk about in order to get closer to the best version of yourself is you don't want to just look after the version of yourself. Now you want to look after the version of yourself that you're going to be in five days, five months, five years down the road. And I think having that mindset can really help spark people to make sure that they do mobility and durability because mobility, mobility and durability. Yeah, it does. You know, it makes you feel a little bit better now, but it's really important to realize how much better you're going to feel five years down the road. If you do these things on a consistent basis. Uh, And next thing I kind of want to move to is a lot of people who listen to this podcast, probably to a certain extent uh, are runners and not, not necessarily they go on long distance runs, but to a certain extent they're runners and maybe have had shin splints or they've had foot injuries, they've had plantar fasciitis and things like this. What are some different things that people can do to strengthen the feet and the muscles around their feet that they might not necessarily think about? Like I know a lot of people, you know, roll out their feet with a tennis ball or lacrosse ball. And I know that's a good thing, but what are some other things that people can do to help hopefully prevent things moving forward and not wait until an injury occurs? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I love that. Um, I'm I'm thinking low hanging fruit here and just trying to be as like simple as possible, right. Without trying to talk about like specific setups and and postures and drills and whatnot. I think a good thing is one, just trying to be barefoot as much as you can. And, you know, it doesn't even need to necessarily be straight barefoot. It could even just be taking off your shoes or sandals and just trying to walk around in your socks. 
if that's like step one for somebody. Uh, but I think like getting away from the shoe for a little bit and being able to just sit, allow your foot and the muscles and the joints inside of your feet to like express themselves. Like that's number one. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, number two, I think that people who are constantly on their feet running and, and pushing their body to the limits on a, on a weekly basis, I think that, you know, some type of like a, a soft tissue, like some manual work, like, uh, the foam rolling or not the foam roll, but like the tennis ball, the lacrosse ball stuff for like the bottom of your foot and for your shins are really, really big. I think that's, that's amazing. And that's great. And to be honest, like I would highly recommend that even if you're somebody who doesn't run or somebody who isn't very active, someone who maybe doesn't even have like a consistent workout practice, like that is still a very valuable thing to do for your body and your overall health and longevity. Um, and then as far as just like maybe more specific to performance training to like runners, like most runners and most you know, athletes have movement tendencies and asymmetries which some therapists and doctors might like try to scare people. I hear it all the time about like, Oh, your pelvis is rotated forward on the right side by a couple of degrees. But to be honest, like we are all made asymmetrical, like the way that our organs, the way that our body is set up, like we were made to have some asymmetries. So like having asymmetries isn't bad. I think what happens is we have overuse injuries, right? This the syndrome of overuse. And so some of that is coming from like our movement tendencies. And so in that case, that's where I would say, okay, that is like where we want to maybe address some of those asymmetries and maybe close the gap between one side of the foot and the other, or one ankle and the other. Um, so things like, you know, of uh, uh, single leg holds. And of course, like for anyone who's a more of a visual learner, I'm sure we'll attach at the end of the show, like the social media where they can kind of get a visual, but you know, doing things like on your midfoot and on the ball of your foot rather than like gripping and using your toes. I know growing up for me playing basketball, they would always tell me be on your tippy toes, right? And so I always thought, okay, get on your tippy toes. And what that led to was like my toes, like always gripping like into the ground and curling a lot, which isn't bad until you experience some injury or setback. And so that is when I started to really learn like, oh no, like this is the way the foot is supposed to work. Like most athletes, most runners will grip at the toes. Most athletes, most runners will live. If this is my right foot here, they'll live in what we call like a little bit of supination. So they'll just have this tendency to live on the outside edge of their foot, which again, like some of the best athletes in the world will have those tendencies in a slow mo video. You'll see it. So it's not that like that is bad, but if your joint, if your ankle joint, your foot doesn't have access to kind of both ends of the spectrum, and you're, you know, not choosing to move a certain way, but it's the only way your body knows how to move. That's usually where we'll see some type of injury or setback. And so, so to that point, like one, if somebody is living on the outside edge of the foot, like just basically doing some very basic lunging or a basic static single leg hold where their goal is to find like the base of their big toe and their heel and that kind of like a, a pinky toe ball of the foot midfoot area and basically kind of driving through that like triangle on their foot, you know, that's going to allow them to kind of feel some of that medial arch, right? So again, if people are living on the outside, more of the lateral arch is going to be kind of the, the strongest arch of the foot. And so sometimes that inside edge stuff doesn't really work very well. It doesn't like to articulate itself, uh, which could, again, just end up leading to a lot of stiffness in a certain part of the foot, which eventually lead to like a knee injury or, you know, a hamstring deal or whatever it may be. So I'm sorry. I know I could probably go down a rabbit hole, but now you're good. Just trying to find like, you know, different postures and positions where you're actually using your whole foot, your toes are spread open and you can find that triangle on the bottom of your foot. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. I think to try to sum up what you talked about to help, minimize the likelihood of a, a foot injury or f muscle around the foot and ankle is, you know, spend time bare feet or barefoot. If you need a, a lacrosse ball, like roll it out. If you're, if you're spending a lot of time on your feet, or even if you're not spending a lot of time on your feet, use it on your, uh, your feet, use it on your shins. And then, like you said, pay attention and just be aware of your weight distribution on your feet and realize that maybe it's not bad where you spend the most time, but Spend some time doing some exercises, moving around the weight distribution, whether it's the middle of the foot, the, the front of the foot, the outside of the foot, the inside of the foot, the back of the foot. Just spend some time strengthening your muscles in the feet on the different areas so that when 
you are placed in a vulnerable space on, on that part of the foot, you have less likelihood of injury. I feel like that is kind of what people need to take away from it is an actionable item from it. But I kind of want to move a little bit away from the mobility for now and into one of the things that we that you mentioned really quickly before hopping on the podcast about how you have the ability to impact so many young people's lives because you train all different kinds of people, right? You train athletes from nine years old to up, you train moms, you train professional athletes, college athletes. But one of the things that you mentioned beforehand is what really fills you up is impacting young people's lives. So what about it slash what message do you like to give to young people rather than simply giving, getting them to spend time on different areas of their foot? <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. Um, that's a great question. So what I would say, at least first, just to speak to the physical point, how that leads to everything else. Like I've realized that the physical stuff right now, especially with athletes, especially for the ones that I am meeting, you know, in college, you know, guys who are a little bit older and more seasoned, that is like the uh, entry point where we can kind of have some common, you know, similarities there where, Hey, you love sports. I love sports. You want to maximize your performance. I want to help you do that with some things that you might not have thought about before. So that's kind of like the, the entry point for a lot of the relationships that I'm able to create. Right. Um, but then, yeah, looking beyond that, like just helping young athletes, I think that for myself growing up, I think we all kind of have a little bit of this in our, in our background, in our story of, when I was a young athlete, like I had the skills trainer, I had the strength coach, you know, I had the shooting coach, like, you know, I, I tried to be really mindful about sleep and nutrition. Um, but looking back on it, like it was really nothing compared to what I know and what I still not only for athletes and everyone else, but for myself as well. So I think that like, just trying to like leave the space better than what I found it and just remembering like, okay, this is what my process was in high school and, you know, the beginning years of college. And then when I, for lack of a better term, felt like I was woken and I felt like I was able to empower myself with, you know, being around really smart people, having great mentors, having them educate me and then me apply it. And then me realizing like, whoa, like if this, if I'm seeing this impact, you know, then I, I know for a fact the people that I'm able to impact or able, the people I'm able to speak to and create relationships with they're going to feel this as well. And so I've seen the profound impact it's had on my life from a physical standpoint, but also like from a mental standpoint, like I'm a huge firm believer that like physical, spiritual, and emotional, like all that is tied in. You know, some people will maybe say your, you know, your emotions are, 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 you know, connected into your physical body. I would agree with that to a certain extent. I would, I, I think that in college, I was always lifting really big, heavy weights because I thought that was the you know the thing to do, and that was how I got better at basketball. This is what you have to do. And looking back on it, I always felt like I was like on edge. I always felt like very tense. I remember being in class like after lifting and just feeling like like amped up, like I was ready to go play a football game. Basically, like, I wanted to go crack, crack some heads or something. And I remember when I was you know um, I guess educated upon this body weight training, the mobility and all this kind of stuff around like, well, this is what, you know, real um, optimized nutrition really looks like. And this is what optimized sleep feels like. Like I remember thinking about all that stuff and applying it. And I just remember like my mental and like my body just feeling for lack of a better term, like loose um, at ease, like more present, and I know that those are words that people have probably heard of before and they're, they're, some of them are kind of buzzwords, but like, I really felt that. And there's something to be said about that because I feel like most athletes and people who are kind of growing up like myself, I would kind of throw myself in that bucket, right? The, the travel team, the trainers, the, your whole life is sports. And like, you are an athlete, like that's who you are in your brain. Like you don't really look at other stuff, right? The yoga, ah, it's kind of weird. That's for yogis. The meditation, ah, no, that's weird. Like, I don't want to be in a dark room and do that. You know, eating healthy. Oh no. Like I got a six pack. Like I, I could keep eating McDonald's and pizzas every night. Like I was in those shoes. And I know that when I made that change in my life, it had a profound impact on every aspect of my life. And so as a high level athlete and, or as a high school athlete, as a middle school athlete, as a soccer mom, like I say soccer mom for lack of a better word, but like that 
that like that is going to feel something similar, but they're also going to go through their own experience when they start to install that in their life. Right. Like what I felt might not be exactly what they feel, but I know it's a positive and I know that they're going to be better off for it. Um, you know, and so, yeah, I guess without trying to go down too much of a rabbit hole, the tangent, like, you know, I just, I want to see the holistic aspect. I want people to feel the holistic change that this stuff can have on their life. Yeah. Well, I think what you said with your own experience and what you noted and were aware of with your own experience of when you're always grinding and lifting heavy weights and going high intensity, you just seem a little bit more on edge, not necessarily on edge from a, from a bad standpoint, but you're always, you're always just kind of here and, and maybe your breathing is always a little bit at a faster pace than it would, would otherwise be. And I, you know, I know for instance, after a yoga class, if I ever, when I take a yoga class afterwards for the next three hours, I'm just so much more calm. And I'm almost like, sometimes who is this guy who like I'm uh, in most, most of the time I'm a high energy like this, but I think it's really important for people who do feel like they're always high blood pressure. They always are stressed. They always do have that go, go, go. It, part of it is slowing down and becoming more aware and in tune with yourself through doing some of these exercises. I don't know. I, I really resonate with that when you said it. Yeah, no, 100%. Again, like everyone, everyone has that different internalization, right? Of like the whoa moment or the like aha moment. But yeah, I feel like those are, those are key to have in life. I think we all go through them in different aspects and different points of our life. Um, and so if I could provide that light bulb moment for certain people or, or just plant the seed and then eventually it sprouts, like I'm, I'm game for that. That, that, that fuels me up big time. That's awesome. I want, you know, I, we mentioned, I mentioned how you work with kids of all ages. And so you really have a lot of experience probably seeing who kind of takes it to the nev next level versus who doesn't and who really buys in and, and what are the qualities of that person. So talk to me a little bit about what do you see as the biggest things that allow people who are potentially, you know, in high school or potentially in college, allow them to take it to the next level. Do you feel like, obviously it's a combination of both ability and mindset and all those sorts of things. But what do you, when you see somebody and you're like, I know this person is going to be something, or I know this person has what it takes. What is it that you're seeing that gives you that feeling? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, obviously there's one, there's one piece to that, right? One piece is like the physical aspect where like, you just can see an athlete, you see the way that they move. It's just effortless, right? Like they're just call it more athletic, call it more equipped, whatever the heck you want to call it. Like they just get it right. Like the game is slow to them. Like they can just see things before they happen. Right. That, that's one aspect. I think a thing that is often neglected or maybe not thought of or, or spoken to enough, especially in the athlete realm is the idea of just like character right? Like what is your character beyond like how good you are in your sport? You know, what, what, what do you like in terms of like showing up before a session? Are you right on time? Are you two minutes before? Are you five minutes before Are you there 30 minutes before in the weight room? The weight room is, is a, is a very interesting space because most athletes, not all, most athletes don't like the weight room, especially in basketball. It's not in the culture. And so for me personally, I know that going into it. So I can see when there's certain guys that are bought in that you don't have to tell them how many reps, you don't have to repeat it five times. You don't have to show them the drill five times because they're just as much, you know, they're just as motivated to be there as, as I am, right? Like they want to receive everything that I'm trying to pour out. Um, and obviously with players like that, like regardless of where they go play professionally or collegiate, if they do at all, like you're going to win in life. And I think that that doesn't get spoken to enough, especially around athletes, because everyone is like in this athlete bubble where they don't really want to think about life after basketball or life after sports. But it's at some point, everybody goes through it like it, it's a process. And so for me personally, with the players that I try to really create, you know, these relationships with, you know, obviously it's, this isn't the case with everybody because. I only have so much energy in my day, and this is something I've come to realize recently if I'm constantly pouring out and I don't feel as if the athlete is reciprocating for whatever reason, like there's gotta be a certain point in a dialogue between myself and that individual of, 
okay, I'm giving you 110 and I'm getting 10 from you. And so if that continues to be the case, like I'm just going to continue to have to give you the bare minimum because there's 50 other guys that are working right next to you, working very hard, want to take their game to the next level. And you just don't seem to really want to be here for those right reasons. And don't get me wrong. I've had those conversations with athletes and there has been that switch where, okay, you know what? That was a very genuine conversation. He didn't tell me, you know, I was crap. He didn't tell me I'm a terrible student. I, my goal isn't to push people down. There's, I don't think too much comes from putting guys down, especially in that sports realm. They're used to coaches yelling at them. I can't stand that. I, 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 that's just not my style. It's not the way I get the job done. I would like to have a very clear line of communication of expectation and just like, you know, hey, this is what I'm seeing and this is what I'm feeling. Tell me if I'm right or wrong here. And most of the time, I would say about 90% of the time, there's been that gradual shift because it doesn't just, you know, you know, it's a daily process. You don't just wake up one day and you're like, I'm bought in now. You have to do that on a daily basis and really on an hourly basis with everything that you're doing. Um, but for the most part, I think that athletes don't have those levels of communication sometimes with whoever, parents, you know, uh, coaches, close friends, like it's not cool. It's not cool to like want to have a dialogue around maybe something that's a little bit um, like, hey, we're having a dialogue around you not really being bought in. That doesn't yeah. sound like a positive conversation, but ultimately if we can get to the root of things, then we can help you be, you know, a better athlete. And so that's kind of always been my style of going about it is just let's just clearly communicate about what I think, I, you know, what I think you could use to improve. And I'll be there to water the seed, man. But if you don't want to, if you don't want to do it yourself, like, I can't force you and I can't make you do this thing forever. I resonate so strongly with that as a, as a coach myself. I think that is awesome too. I think, and I really, you know, you do give so much to people and there are certain people who just kind of don't care or don't listen and you tell them over and over again and you can very easily as somebody who's a coach or somebody who's a teacher or whatever line of profession is, if you're servicing somebody else, if you're giving your all to them, but they repeatedly are not giving it to you, I think two things. One, realize don't necessarily take it personally because it's not about you. It's probably about them. And then secondly, be willing to have that dialogue. And like you said, it's it's, it's a really great dialogue because there's you, then there's them, and then there's eff their effort. It's not necessarily that you're criticizing them. It's just that you're addressing the effort that they're giving and what you're feeling from it. And they will, I feel like they, the person that you have the dialogue with probably kind of knows that they're not giving the effort, but they don't really realize that you see it that way. And so it will potentially really shake them and get them to maybe to potentially hopefully change their attitude. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point about like being able to kind of distinguish between the three different things, because again, I think that most athletes just look at themselves as an athlete. I'm an athlete. And like, they forget about who the individual is deep down inside that. And so being able to step away from, okay, that is my character. These are my habits. And this is who I am as an athlete. Like, let's just look at that for what it is. Like, don't take that personal. Like outside of this, if you weren't training here, I would love to go get a bite with you. And I would, you know, I would be a good guy with you. I, I, we could be friends. We could have a relationship there. But if we're talking in this arena, like this arena is here to help you improve. But the improvement doesn't just come with me being here. It doesn't just come with you being here. Like that third party, your habits and your character have to fall in line with what your goals are. So, yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. That's solid. One of the things I wanted to ask you about that's a pretty common question is the question about kind of single sport athletes, especially in high school. And I feel like from my own personal experience and also just from this conversation, I feel like what potentially your answer is and about the single sport athlete is like, if somebody is a one sport athlete and they only train in the ranges of motion and, you know, the plate, the, I feel like the bo the body movements, you know, different sports require different body movements. Some sports are more straightforward. Some are more, more lateral. Some are more at an angle. Some are a little bit higher. Some are a little bit lower. And so I think one of the great things about playing multiple sports is your body gets stronger in all those different ranges of motion and all those different movement patterns. And so 
I feel like you would probably say that playing multiple sports is good in that sense. But at the same time, if you're specializing in one sport, you need a trainer who puts you in all of those different movement patterns and, and things like that. So tell me a little bit about what your approach or what your opinion is about whether or not a kid should be a single sport athlete. We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first, I wanted to share a quick testimonial from a past participant of the 10-week transformation program. I started running the 10WT in the beginning of 2020 and I've had over 150 people on counting go through it and they've seen amazing results both inside and out. If you're inspired to join after listening to the testimonial, then go to nickcarrier.com to learn more. We'll get back to the episode in just a minute, but first, here's what they had to say. Hey, my name is Drew. Um, as for why I joined Nick's program, I was in a bit of a kind of just a routine um, from a previous workout perspective and just was looking to kind of jumpstart and find something new that was going to um, introduce me to some, some new ways of working out that were both more aggressive and, and more scheduled. Getting up early in the morning has been really uh, kind of a game changer for me and, and kind of starting the day off obviously with Nick's two workouts that he does as a group, but you know, I've, I've applied those across all of the workouts that he's built for us um, through the program, and, and I think it's just a great way to start the day. Um, getting, getting here, working hard, uh, and then knowing that you've accomplished that uh, to start the day has been really, uh, it's been really beneficial to me, uh, both from a physical perspective, but from a, a mental perspective as well. My favorite thing about the program has just been the level of planning and um, kind of strategic thinking around you know your goals and how to get there, and then you know, understanding that planning and, and, and all that is one thing, but um, you know, the application of, of those tactics and you know, Nick really helps you to think about. What are the small things in my day that are going to help me get to uh, where I need to go? You should next ten week program. Yeah, no, that's whew, that's a good question. That's a very good question. I would say at a young age, like, and I'm saying young age all the way through high school. I would even say up into your freshman year of high school. Like, you should be kind of exposing yourself to a variety of sports. Um, just off the fact that what you said, like the movement variability, right? Like you're not doing the same movements all the time. So therefore you're going to diminish the amount of injury that could occur from overuse, which most athletes in high school will have overuse injuries nowadays because, you know, they're just playing the same sport all the time. Right. And it's coming from a good place. Like they want to work hard. They're doing the extra skill sessions. They're doing the, you know, all the extra stuff to get their technical skills, like up to a very high level. But there's always a point of diminishing returns. I think that's like, just like anything else in life. And so like being able to be mindful of that is tough because again, you're so, you know, your goal is like, I want to get to the highest level. I have to be in the gym for 10 hours a day, which I understand. But yeah, like, again, there's just like a point of diminishing return where if you keep doing the same thing, you know, you're not really going to see results. You're going to see results up until a certain point. And then actually things are going to start like becoming detrimental. You know what I mean? Like you actually might start seeing some drop off in your performances, which therefore could be even that much more frustrating for somebody. So huge firm believer in that diversify your movement, diversify your environment so that you, your body has to move itself in a variety of ways. And then I guess, you know, once you kind of get into high school and you feel like, okay, this is my sport, then yeah, like I highly recommend diving all the way down in or diving down that rabbit hole. But making sure that the weight room, and again, I say the weight room, um, I, I say the weight room is because I think some people, you know, most often understand that, but let's just call it your performance training. Like your performance training should encompass a variety of, of environments, right? Like I'm a huge believer in like movement variability and variability, variability of environment, because that's going to force your body to have to move in a variety of ways. And it's not like you have to be you know, a basketball player and you have to be able to, I don't know, throw a, you know, throw a baseball uh, uh, 80 miles per hour or whatever. But for a basketball player or like running a hundred meter sprint, like I don't think basketball players need to spend all the time in the world on a track, but there is a lot of benefit in being able to get on a track and open up your stride because in basketball, you don't really open up your stride. It's more like quick acceleration bounce. So like that variability 
could be like very beneficial for athletes. And so like, yeah, I think that if you have a trainer, if you have a system that understands, okay, this is what I need you to do. This is like what the end goal looks like. But these are all these different factors and environments that if I put you in them, it might not look like your sport, but it's going to require your body to adapt. And after you adapt, you're actually going to be more equipped to do your end goal. Like that is what I believe, you know, the goal of a good performance coach, all right. understanding all variables and putting them in a variety of contexts and environments to have to work into. Yeah. I like that variability of movement and, and variability of environment. That was great. Talk to me about a little bit of your own kind of personal routine. Like when you go into, again, the weight room quotes, what is your, if you, if you spent an hour working out, you know, you might do a little bit, yours, your routine might be a little bit different because of how much time you're in the gym. But if you had an hour to work out, what would the different, how would that, what would that look like? Would it start with mobility? Would it end with mobility? Does it have durability and strength training? I mean, what does what do you personally do when it comes to that? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So I think that if I was answering this like for an athlete, a big piece of this always depends or the individual in front of me. So just forget athlete, just individual. Like it would all depend on like what cycle, what phase we're in, right? Like, right. is there something we're training for? Is there something we're gearing up for? Um, is it more short-term goal? Is it a long-term goal? Is this person with me for six months or is this person with me for two weeks, right? Um, so that's always like number one, like working backwards from the goal. Um, if it was someone like myself and, and most of the clients that I serve will always start with some sort of mobility routine, right? Whether that be on the ground or standing. And a big piece of that is just for joint hygiene and movement variability, right? Um, and then the right after that, depending upon what our main focus is that day, let's just say it's a strength training day. Let's say it's like day one of our strength training cycle. Um, I'll usually start with like a little bit of what we'd call like an activation. So if I know we're going to do a uh, some type of lunge, some type of forward lunge that day, like I'm probably going to want to warm up the foot and I'm probably going to want to warm up something around the hip uh, to just know, okay, I'm going to put them in this posture and pattern. So I want to just make sure that those little pieces, the individual hip and the individual ankle are going to be able to um, fold and move in the, in the pattern that is going to have in our main workout. Yeah. Um, so we do the activation two or three rounds, usually some sort of isometric movement. So some type of stability movement where we're trying to co get some uh, force sharing ability between like, you know, the foot, the calf, the quad, the hamstring, the glute. Um, and then we'll go into our main lift. We'll hit our main lift. After that, we'll then go to some auxiliary movements. Usually the auxiliary stuff is going to be two. It can kind of have a two focus hold. One could just be to feed into the main movement for most sports like basketball, it's not a heavy strength based sport. So unless the individual really needed like running, same thing, running is not a big strength based sport, like, or, or, or mass and, and high force sport. So like, we probably not going to spend a lot of time in the auxiliary stuff trying to like, okay, we got to beef you up. We got to get you a little bit like stronger. We, we need to focus on like getting the little pieces a little bit stronger. So your, your lunge numbers can go up. So your strength can go up. So the second fold beyond that then is just uh, longevity. So what does this individual have in terms of like weaknesses in his, in his or her body? Let's go attack those weaknesses in the auxiliary, usually some type of core work, usually some sort of like offset unilateral movement. Um, and then after that, again, depending upon where we're at in the time of the year, I like to either finish off with some sort of like, like what you said, mobility or some type of like plyometric uh, activity because I'm really big on like restoring elasticity, right? Even if we're in a strength phase and we're trying to get, we're trying to put on 10 pounds on this basketball player. I want to end the session knowing he's probably going to go get on the court. If not that day tomorrow, like his sport is very springy. So I need like running, we need tissues and tendons and muscles to work back and forth with one another so that they can work efficiently. If we just leave the weight room feeling like very stiff, and the muscle isn't able to glide and the connective tissues aren't able to glide on one another uh, efficiently, then they could potentially pull something. They could potentially have a, a very minor, you know, non-contact soft tissue injury. And so doing like some backward uh, pogos, doing like some lateral pogos, doing like very light movements on the feet is actually another great way to help restore elasticity after going through something like a strenuous strength phase. So 
Hopefully I didn't go too much down the rabbit hole, but that would kind of be like the general principles of like how it would construct something. Yeah, no, that's all. That's all. And definitely something that people can work with uh, moving forward in, in their training plan as well. I want to make sure I, I get you out of here on time, Christian. But before I ask the last question, I just want to acknowledge you, man. I think that your work with athletes and, and non-athletes is just something that a lot of people are not implementing into their routine. You know, I've trained people and oftentimes in the workouts that we do wherever it is, we don't necessarily prioritize the mobility and the durability as, as much as we need to. And oftentimes that's just something that potentially group fitness is not able to implement as well. And a lot of people just need to do on their own. And so a lot of people, I want to acknowledge you for getting people out of the mindset of focusing just on the current version of yourself, but also focusing on the future version of yourself because you talk so much about longevity and durability and all those sorts of things. And, and obviously you're making such an impact on so many people's lives. So I just want to acknowledge you and, and appreciate you joining today. Hell yeah. No, thank you so much, Nick. Anytime I can articulate like what, you know, what I'm able to do and the impact I'm able to have, like it's a, it's a real honor. So thank you very much for having me on here and allowing me to, you know, give a little bit of my background. Yeah, dude. Well, everybody listening, I know you're going to want to go learn more about some of the specific things that he was talking about in the, in the podcast today. So make sure you go follow him on Instagram at Christian G Placencia. Uh, I have started to probably on a daily basis, pull up his profile and look at different things for both my own implementation. And then some of the things that I work with my clients as well. So I appreciate you helping me with that. And you can also go check out the dur uh, durableathlete.com. He also has durable athlete app that has mobility programs, strengthening programs, nutrition stuff, all that good stuff. So durableathlete.com. And again, at Christian G Placencia, uh, is there any other good place for people to go support you and follow you and learn more? Man, I think you hit them all right there. The the social media, the website, durableathlete.com, where you could find more about the app there. And then obviously you yeah, have the app on the app store. Yeah, that's that's all great right there. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah, dude. Well, uh, last question, still got you here for one more, is I think that to get closer to the best version of yourself, it's both a constant journey and a unique journey. I don't really think we ever get to the best version of ourselves. I think it's a constant evolution. And I also think that the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So with that said, for you personally, if there are three things that Christian can currently do or currently work on to get closer to that best version of yourself that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? I would say work-life balance is definitely one of them. I would say another one is I mean, I guess it would all kind of fall under that umbrella, but I think just being able to give my, myself some space to like really, like, I know this is going to sound kind of funny, but like eating, like I'm so, I feel like I'm always rushing from one thing to the next. So I'm always just throwing food down my body and I'm like never really able to kind of sit and enjoy it and be a little bit slower, which obviously from a digestive process is like very important. So that's like another big thing because lately I've had a couple little stomach issues and I think that it is stemming from that. Um, and then three, to be honest, like um, it has to do really with my relationship with my fiance. I think that sometimes being so busy, we both of us work within our business that it's easy to kind of just say like, Hey, we got work. Hey, we got things to do. But you know, as we get married this year and, and we strengthen our bond, like getting married doesn't necessarily just do that. And so I need to make sure that as I continue to grow and as we continue to grow our business, that our relationship doesn't stay, you know, lagging behind. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, those are three great things. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that. And I know everybody, like I said, go follow him on Instagram at Christian G Placencia. Go check out the website, durableathlete.com. Take your shoes off. Spend some time on the different areas of your feet. Spend some time in variable movement patterns and variable environments and all the things that uh, Christian talked about today. So appreciate you joining and I will uh, talk to you soon. Appreciate it, bro. Uh, thank you, Nick.